Today we're speaking with Rodolfo Novak, co-founder of CoinKite, maker of OpenDime, the world's first Bitcoin bearer instrument. So before we get into it, I first wanted to talk a little bit about what I love about OpenDime. As of late, Bitcoin is kind of turning into a settlement layer of sorts. That seems to be the path forwards in terms of scalability in layer two solutions like Lightning, and I'm fine with that. But what I love about OpenDime is that it feels like it fulfills the original vision Satoshi laid out in the white paper of peer-to-peer -peer anonymous electronic cash. Also, it's tangible. You can hold it in your hands. It's like a cassatious coin, but you don't have to worry about the private key having been compromised. But before we go too far down the path, Rodolfo, everyone has their Bitcoin story. Why don't you tell us about yours? So um, I got into Bitcoin in, I guess, late 2011. And uh, through the, I guess, uh, as Peter sent me the, paper, the, the link to the slash dot uh, article, and uh, the thing seemed to be a little too good to be true, and it was interesting, but um, but you know like, I didn't give a lot of attention. And then like uh, my business partner Peter gave it a bit of more of a read and sort of investigated a bit more, and he was like, no, no, this is this is really cool. Hmm. And uh, I think just before the new year, so I think it was still 2011. Uh, I was working this time series uh, search engine. And uh, one of the data points we added was Bitcoin price. Um, <clears throat> and I think like one of the only places at the time you could get the price was the IRC chat. Um, and then um, we were like, okay, great, this thing is interesting. Uh, let's, let's build something. It, it really was complicated and there wasn't a lot of, um, a lot of information about it online yet. So we, we went out and we built uh, a Bitcoin Explorer like a blockchain explorer. It was called BTC Look. We actually managed to put the whole blockchain in Redis, so like in RAM, and you could uh, you could like sort of navigate the blockchain in a visualizer. Wow. It had like bubbles to sort of break and Sounds stuff. Sounds cool. It was really neat. Um, a lot of people actually checked it out. It was a btclook.com. And so like that sort of helped us fully understand how the tech, the tech actually worked. And uh, we were like, okay, great. Now what do we do with this? <laughs> Nobody accepts the stuff. Uh, it's very hard to get still. So, you know, like everybody else, we're like, okay, great. Let's try to make this accessible to more people. We were like, okay, you know, if it's money and it's digital, then uh, why not have uh, payment terminals for this thing? Um, so we, we set out to, to build a payment terminal that, was, that could work like Visa before Bitcoin. We built it. We brought it to... Um, uh, I think it was Bitcoin 2013 in uh, in San Jose, that that one of the first big conferences. Uh, we showed it around. Um, we couldn't find a wallet that was suitable for people to actually receive the money in. It's not like you can put money on blockchain.info. <laughs> and then uh, we built CoinKite.com, and uh, that sort of became our main business as we started to to grow that. Um, and then sort of. We, we played around with Bitcoin as being a big wallet and um, you know, we were doing a serious volume of uh, transactions, but uh, dealing with privacy issues and uh, making sure every, everybody's money is protected. Um, we sort of, after a few interesting uh, um, encounters with uh, governments and uh, other agencies, we decided to sort of move on to just hardware. Hmm. <laughs> so on that note, uh, OpenDime, can you describe it and talk a bit about what you feel is its unique value proposition? So we, we, we've been sort of exploring, like, how can you make Bitcoin physical, right? And, and it, was, it was sort of like, yes, you, you can do it, right, with very complicated or very sort of expensive hardware, right, like a general purpose computer, like a phone. And... And we couldn't sort of like live with that. And, and we wanted to make something that like was more like a bare bond, right? Like something like, like, like literal cash. Cash like, money. Exactly, right? Like, like Satoshi said, you know, like, let's, like, let me create something so that people can transact anonymously, right? Without a central authority. And, and that sort of was the guiding principle in how we made OpenDime. So we, after a few years of sort of research, we, we came up with something that we think was the sort of the best solution for that. A cheap, 
disposable PCB with with like the private key inside so that you don't know and uh, and that makes it into a bear bond. Are you concerned at all about open dime being used for a legal activity? How expensive are those pants you're wearing? <laughs> I use cheap pants. Okay. Um, I'm a big cheap fan, cheap pants fan. Um, I, I think that the main the main issue is uh, it's just like cash, right? Like it, it's not my job or 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 anybody's, but sort of like society to decide what is okay and what's not okay. I, I'm I'm just here to create technology, right? I create a new digital sort of like platform for digital money and now you know people will use it i mean you know even Joseph can can use this now because you know the the corners are round <laughs> and uh you know it's much easier for you to uh, insert do you, do you ever get tired of the prison wallet memes oh are you kidding me i love it i i mean like i i find it like i'm extremely like happy that people are exploring yeah, the topic yeah. very well I, I think i've made most of them uh just to tell you <laughs> uh my, my favorite um well there's the one you just mentioned i think that was alex miller who coined that one about the rounded corners but i like the uh the the exhibit meme where he's like yo dog <laughs> Uh, I heard you like prison wallets, so we put a prison wallet on your prison wallet, and we'll get to that. The, the architecture of the the version two is a little different than version one. That's right. Right. So, um, so yeah, well, I mean, you know, you have a linear, you know, hole now, so you, you can leave a strain. Right. So actually, do you want to um, maybe tell us the difference uh, between uh, version one and version two in terms? Yeah. Of so private key? so version one, I, I don't have one in hands, but uh, uh, version one. Um, it was sort of like the how our first idea was, you know, like you'd break the PCB, and um, and you know, it was sort of like we we needed more feedback, right? So version two, you know, we added a lot of gold for signaling, and uh, we um, we we put a linear hole, and we changed the way you break it. Now um, it, it's actually a little stronger. You actually have to to stick like a pin. Or something and push fairly hard right. into this hole okay and that would pop out this this little component and that would make it is there any concern is there any concern you might break the board as you're pressing the force on I, the I mean fr4 which is the material right. you use for this stuff at two millimeter is, 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 is this is very strong right yeah. right this is like you know epoxy fiberglass essentially right like it, you can't Right. I mean, you know, this is still a piece of electronic equipment and it still should be somewhat, you know, protective of it. But, right. But it, it's not like flimsy, right? And it's also covered in, uh, I think it's a, a pollen island of the types. Um, and and uh, this sort of protects it a little more. Right, right. Uh, where do you manufacture them? Well, like everything else, it's made in Shenzhen. Ah, yes. Uh, we, we do all the design, we do all the development, the firmware, everything here. We actually use a pretty expensive micros so that they're a little bit more reliable. Um, and uh, we ship everything to China. They put together there and uh, we do re the reprogramming here. So maybe you can tell me a bit about the tamper resistance and tamper evidence of the device and its security in general. So because it's, it's a bare board, um, you can actually inspect to make sure that you know things are, are fairly kosher in there, um, and then you know for you to actually spend the money, you have to break something on it. So it would be very hard for people to sort of fake that. But you should never trust somebody you can't trust, right? So you know once you insert in the computer, you're going to be prompted to to look that you know it's either sealed or unsealed right right even if that computer is a little compromised there's still like scripts there yeah. that will make sure that this device is for real mm -hmm. on the version 2 though we added a tag chip this tag chip it, it's you know in cryptography we never say anything is impossible but it's it's nearly impossible to master this this micro this micro was created so that you can store a key in it and uh, and then sort of authenticate over it. You can sign something with that key to make sure that you have the right stuff. Right, that's great. Uh, do you have any plans to add an LCD to display the public key or balance? We, we would love to. Uh, you know, it always comes down to cost, right? right? So, you know, like 
let's assume that there is what five million, ten million Bitcoin users, maybe now I, I'd say more closer to five million yeah. Bitcoin users. It's still a fairly small market, right? Um, if, if Bitcoin, you know, independently of the price, which doesn't really matter, if Bitcoin had, you know, a, a, a nice economy with, you know, let's say 10, 100 million people using it, then we would have enough economies of scale right. to use a slightly different technologies and even maybe customize the, the microchip die. And that would provide us sort of like enough price cost savings to add a screen or to do other things. Right. Or you could have a dedicated separate terminal, maybe that you could plug these into. So we do have something that we, you know, it's on the bench so far. Uh, we, we do have a sort of like it's a verifier. It's a little machine, battery powered, uh, that you stick the open dime in, and it tells you the private, the, sorry, the public key or private key of it. Yeah, the private key would be bad. Yeah, <laughs> uh, unless you unseal it. Yes. Remember, yes. even if you like, even if our own probes, like yes. we cannot take the private key out until we break it. Right. Yes. Uh, do you recommend people use the open dime for cold storage? Um, that's a tough one, because I mean, I personally do use a few open dimes with sort of like nominal values in them as cold storage. Right. Uh, but uh, I, I'm adamant about people always backing up any private key so that they do cold storage. Now, the nice thing is you're not gonna get something safer than this to generate a private key. Mm -hmm. So you could buy a few of these, yeah. you you unseal them all, right? Right, And and you oh, load them, you load wow. them with Bitcoin like in a, you use like a, like a, a cold computer, right? Yeah. You copy those private keys down so they're backed up and then you deposit the money in you them. Know what? I never thought of using it that way. That's That's actually brilliant. It's it's essentially like one of the most secure ways of generating a private key. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the entropy? Yeah. Well, so the entropy source is uh, we have a few, right? So there's the number generator on the micro. Then there is uh, uh, some entropy from CoinKite, so some nonce from us, and then there is also yours. So when you put the open dime into the computer, you drop in some files that are right. completely like we would never have a way of knowing and we use that entropy to generate a private key. So it, you know for sure that we were not able to, to, uh, to create a rainbow table. Right, right. So um, one thing I've been thinking about, I'm looking at the latest uh, Apple MacBooks, and as you probably know, they don't have traditional USB ports. Are you planning to make USB-C or even wireless open dimes that might operate over NFC or Bluetooth? Well, so, the the main thing with uh, with ports is uh, we, we decided to go with the most standard port right right sure. uh, like everything else including an iphone yeah. on the new mac you still need a dongle <laughs> right I, even apple does not make usb3 yeah. uh, iphone cables yet right if you could do it over nfc or bluetooth you really could make a cassation yes you could make it circular so we, we have we have some of those prototypes on our bench actually and uh after like sort of extensive playing around with this stuff, we just don't feel like it's either safe enough or usable right. enough or cheap enough to make it to the market. This is sort of like, you know, like out of like 50 ideas, this is the most robust uh, sure. and cheapest way of doing it. Right. Uh, do you have any plans to expand support to other cryptocurrencies like Ether or Doge? Um, Mm, not at the time. <laughs> I, see, it, it's an economical problem. I, I mean, like, I, I don't really care, right? I, I mean, aside from my personal views on, on some other altcoins. Right. Um, you know, if there is enough market, I, I don't care, I'll make it. But yeah. just there isn't. So uh, when will the version 2 be available? Um, so we are planning to ship probably in March. Uh, so China now has its uh, Chinese holiday, uh, yes. uh, New Year's holiday, and uh, that pushes things. Oh, well, my fun. order is in and I can't wait to get it. I, I love the first generation uh, open dimes and, and the new ones look amazing. So uh, thank you very much, Rodolfo, for your time. Well, it was uh, my pleasure. Thank you.